This video was sponsored by World Anvil. We can't guarantee the furnace is heated by Dragonfire, but we can't guarantee that it isn't either. Dragons, you know the ones, big, scaly, fire-breathing, sometimes not any of those things. But let's be real, dragons aren't so easily defined, and that's what makes them so special. Dragon comes from the Greek drakon, meaning dragon. No, but literally it means one who stares. But despite the Greek etymology of the word, dragons aren't localized to any one region or mythos. In fact, they're damn near universal. So before we get into their uses in modern media, let's run down some prominent mythical dragons. Isn't this fun? You get a trope talk and a myths video for the price of one. Chronologically, we can probably pin down the first known dragons in human history as Tiamat and Abzu from Mesopotamian mythology. Abzu and Tiamat are primordial deities and lovers representing fresh and salt water respectively. And when Abzu is killed by the new generation of gods, Tiamat is enraged and gives birth to the first dragons. Abzu and Tiamat themselves themselves aren't really physically described, they're both primordial gods who got killed and repurposed into forming the actual world, but Tiamat is occasionally represented as a giant serpent, and her draconic offspring are described as hybrids between serpents, lions, and birds, so pretty textbook dragons. We can also pin down a couple early dragon-like monsters in the Tanakh with Behemoth and Leviathan, two apocalyptic monsters, again vaguely described, but representing primordial chaos on land and in the sea, respectively. The Leviathan is directly derived from Lotan, a massive sea serpent from Ugarit mythology that was defeated by a storm god. And keep an eye on that theme, we'll come back to it. It. Meanwhile, Behemoth seems to have influenced Bahamut, which in some Arabian mythologies is an occasionally winged enormous sea monster and or fish that carries the world. Egypt gives us the noteworthy serpents Apophis and Aruberos. Apophis, as we've discussed before, is the giant spiky serpent that tries to eat Ra every night, while the Aruberos is an unnamed piece of popular iconography found in some funerary texts that alchemists got, like, way into later. The Norse give us Jormungandr, another enormous god-eating serpent, and another one famously defeated by a storm god, in this case Thor. This is a motif across basically all Indo-European mythologies and even some beyond that, so we're gonna be seeing a lot of it. But this also isn't the only dragon around here. The Nidhogg is a dragon that gnaws at the roots of Yggdrasil, and in the Volsunga saga, we have Fafnir, one of the most iconic folkloric dragons. A dwarf transformed into a dragon through his own greed, and also maybe that giant pile of cursed gold he stole. Hinduism gives us Vritra, a draconic personification of drought and archenemy of the storm god Indra. Yet another storm god versus giant snake mortal 11 scenario. In Mesoamerica, the most well known dragon is the deity Quetzalcoatl, a flying feathered serpent that pops up in basically every pre colonial civilization in the region. He's not the only dragon, though. Shiokoatl is a small fire serpent wielded as a weapon by Huitzilopochtli the sun god. If you've ever seen a picture where it looks like he's holding a curved spiked club, it's actually a fun-sized dragon. And a bit further south in the Inca Empire is the Amaru, a two-headed serpent that lives at the bottom of bodies of water. Australia gives us the Rainbow Serpent, a common figure in most Australian Aboriginal cultures, always a giant many-colored serpent and usually associated with water or rain. And while this is an important and interestingly recurrent figure, it was also kind of latched onto by European anthropologists who really liked the idea of a centrally important sky deity and glossed over A, every every other important figure, and B, the fact that the Rainbow Serpent is not one pan-Australian deity, and is portrayed very differently by many different Aboriginal cultures. Some places it's a creator spirit, elsewhere it's a bit more of a classic monster, it's more of a motif than a singular central god. Anyway, Greece gives us a metric buttload of dragons of all shapes and sizes, starting with the classic Hydra, a many-headed venomous swamp monster. Ladon is the dragon that guards the Garden of the Hesperides, and an unnamed dragon fills a similar role guarding the Golden Fleece. Helios's chariot is sometimes pulled by winged serpents, Ketos is the sea monster that threatens Andromeda until Perseus kills it, and Python is a chthonic serpent formerly in charge of Delphi who's killed by Apollo so he can claim the oracle there. Typhon's dragon status is a bit debatable because he has a human head, but he does follow the Dragon vs. Storm God Ultimate Smackdown format when he's defeated by Zeus, so I'll say he counts. Fun fact, there's also an Armenian deity, Vahagan the Dragon Slayer, who is also a Storm God. It's seriously everywhere, I don't know why. As mentioned way back when I did Mwindo, Karimu is a seven-headed dragon in the folklore of the African Great Lakes region in the rare position of being blood brothers with the Storm God instead of Nemesis. In Western Europe, both four-legged winged dragons and wyvern two-legged winged dragons, are very popular in heraldry, especially in Wales, where a dragon is on the flag. And there are quite a lot of ballads about dragons causing problems for a region before being killed by a passing knight or saint. Some of these were also metaphors for Christianity triumphing over paganism. And, of course, this region also gives us the unnamed dragon from Beowulf, which keeps the traditional venomous quality while also adding fire breath, a trait that has since become iconic. Meanwhile, China kind of has the dragon market cornered. They're incredibly common symbols representing strength, power, divinity, fortune, basically all good things. They're also very commonly seen as deities of bodies of water. There's evidence that dragons were prominent symbols in the area as early as the Neolithic. Chinese dragons, like many others, appear as combinations of several other animal traits, but with Chinese dragons it's actually very specific. Stag antlers, horse camel or crocodile head, demon or rabbit eyes, snake neck, clam frog or tortoise intestines, carp scales, eagle claws, tiger paws, and cow ears. Prominent dragons in Chinese mythology include long
Guang Shen, the Dragon King, Ao Guang, the Azure Dragon of the East China Sea, Ao Quin, the Vermilion Dragon of the South China Sea and the Essence of Summer, Ao Shun, the Black Dragon of Lake Baikal and the Essence of Winter, and Ao Run, the White Dragon of Qinghai Lake and the Essence of Autumn, who you may remember from their cameos in Journey to the West. There's also Huan Long, the draconic form of the Yellow Emperor, which is the center of the cosmos, the element Earth, and the Chinese quintessence. Chinese dragons are basically all divine and fundamentally good, which is quite a change from the Indo-European model of general monster. And Japan sorta has two types of dragons. One kind, the Ryu, is very similar to Chinese dragons, typically water-based, divine, and occasionally wish-granting. And then on the other hand, there's things like Ikuchi, a sea serpent yokai that sinks ships, and Yamato no Orochi, an eight-headed snake killed by, wait for it, Suzano the Storm God, boom. Now that's a pretty solid rundown of the major folkloric dragons. Obviously there are more, but I'm trying to do a video here, and this gives us plenty to work with. Now, one might be tempted to try and do some kind of taxonomical breakdown of categories of dragons based on morphology and stuff. Numbers of legs, wings, preferred habitat, etc. But while that could be fun, there's not really a point here. Dragons aren't a real animal that evolved. You can't arrange them on a cladogram to try and figure out when exactly fire breath developed and if it was before or after ground-based dragons split off from the sea serpent line or whatever. We're looking at these guys from a story perspective, so instead of trying to categorize by legs or wings or scales, let's start breaking them down by what role they play in a story and what qualities inform that. So let's start big. Thanks to Tiamat, Abzu, Bahamut, Behemoth, Leviathan, Typhon, Jormungandr, and Apophis, the concept of an apocalyptically enormous dragon is pretty well precedented. Apocalyptic dragons tend not to feature directly in a story except as a super final boss and are more likely to be in the background lore as some kind of ultimate enemy or former threat defeated by a god or something, unless it's a kaiju movie, in which case full steam ahead on the dragon apocalypse. Apocalyptic dragons are also often evil gods or god-scale threats, and it's also not unheard of for dragons to be framed as explicitly demonic. This probably has roots in the Western European dragon as metaphor for paganism thing, but dragons, even the really big ones, aren't always evil. Now thanks to Chinese dragons, Quetzalcoatl, Tiamat, Abzu, Bahamut, and the Rainbow Serpent, one surprisingly common draconic trait in modern media is divinity. Many dragons are either gods, godlike, or just generally magical and positive thinking. Divine dragons usually fill a support role rather than being the focus of the story, providing guidance, wisdom, magic, or whatever. Being much more magical than the typical monster dragon, these dudes can sometimes end up being a bit more of a dragon ex machina than anything else, popping out when the story needs some added coolness and then going away again. Related to the divine dragon and drawing on the same roots is the dragon shifter, a dragon who can turn human or at least humanoid. Chinese dragons could sometimes take human form and Quetzalcoatl has one too, so there's plenty of precedent here among the more intelligent, less malevolent mythological dragons. This concept was kind of solidified in modern media by Dungeons and Dragons, where all dragons gain the ability to take a humanoid form, and this is, in fact, how half dragons happen. Beyond D&D, you can sometimes get characters who are descended from dragons and have sparse draconic traits for this reason. Also, sometimes if your big bad needs an upgrade before the final battle, they'll turn into a dragon. Just happens sometimes. Actually related to that is the draconic curse variant, which originates specifically from Fafnir, a dwarf who gradually transformed into a dragon. There's actually a few other sources for this kind of thing, including the Norwegian tale of Prince Lindworm, a prince who was born a dragon because his mother didn't listen to a witch and was only fixed by a brave young peasant girl who did listen to a witch, but anyway, mostly the source is Fafnir. In this version, a transformation into a dragon is a curse, often as a punishment for greed or hubris or something. This shows up in one of the later Narnia books as a direct homage to Fafnir. Also, in some lamer cases, it's not a physical transformation, but a character might start acting more draconic because of some cursed gold or whatever. Sorry, Hobbit movies, just because your dragon sickness plotline has roots in classic Scandinavian folklore doesn't mean it isn't stupid. Anyway, on a related note, dragons often like hoarding stuff. Fafnir and his giant golden horde is a major source for this one, as is Beowulf's dragon, which was provoked by the theft of part of its horde. But Greek mythology also has its fair share of dragons protecting magical artifacts or locations, so there's lots of precedent for this one. It's probably the most cliched dragon trope these days. Dragons just love them some gold, I guess. In the cases of more intelligent dragons, this can be something of an amusing character quirk, but in more antagonistic and monstrous cases, it's likely to be their driving motivation, either protecting their horde or seeking out more stuff to put in it. Some modern media plays with the idea of dragons hoarding specific things depending on their individual personality, like first edition comic books or really shiny rocks. Amusingly, while dragon hordes used to be very common in Western European folklore, they became less popular MacGuffins as the region got more into chivalry, because gold is a much less noble reward than rescuing a princess. And on that note, some dragons are way into sacrificial young ladies. Between all those Western European folktales of knights rescuing princesses, the Japanese folktale of Suzanoo killing the Orochi to save a girl from being sacrificed to it, and the iconic Greek myth of Perseus rescuing Andromeda from Ketos, it seems that dragons really like endangering young women. This is another pretty cliched one, and between that and the additionally maligned cliche of sexy lamp damsel in distress, most writers only bring it up to subvert it these days. The dragon's just misunderstood, the girl is actually the villain, the girl is doing the rescuing, the girl is the dragon, the girl is dating the dragon, it can get pretty weird. Now, a lot of modern dragons actually get written as not bad, just misunderstood. After all, if you're looking to subvert a cliche, dragon is bad guy is a pretty well-trodden one. How this manifests kind of depends on how smart the dragon is, or rather, if it can communicate with humans. If the dragon can talk and is basically just a big scaly person, then one conversation with the protagonists is usually sufficient to reveal that it's actually a decent sword. But if the dragon's more animalistic, what usually happens is it turns out they're basically cats. Cats aren't 
malevolent, but they can be a bit antisocial and hard to read if you don't really know your way around them. And if you scale that up about 500 times and give it fire breath, you can get some pretty serious collateral damage from misidentifying something as a scratching post. And humans might conclude that they are actually malicious when they're really just misunderstood and potentially adorable. Dragon as cat is an extremely popular interpretation, and as a side benefit, it can make dragons cute. Win-win. Now, this last one is actually kinda new. There's no folkloric precedent for it as far as I can tell, and instead it can be traced back to Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Riders of Pern, which first came out in 1967. True to the name, this book features dragons as noble steeds for the first time basically ever. The dragons in this series form unique, lifelong psychic bonds with their chosen rider so they can work together as a single unit, and if one member dies, the other one usually doesn't survive either. This concept was later borrowed wholesale by Aragon, which is probably a little more familiar to most of you guys. Dragon as noble steed has since become a very popular concept, because let's be real, dragons kick ass, and therefore riding a dragon makes you kick ass. Amusingly, the concept of bad guys riding dragons is actually a bit older. Tolkien had his ringwraiths riding fell beasts, which he wouldn't define as dragons because he had very specific opinions about what constituted a real dragon, but were nevertheless large, scary winged animals. So all these traits are pretty cool and overall create a lot of possibilities for dragons in fiction. But it does kind of beg a question. Why dragons? This is a lot of ground for one trope to cover. Dragons can be everything from divine to satanic, animalistic to brilliant, personable to completely alien, and anywhere on the moral spectrum. We can't even pin down a physical definition of what a dragon really is. Now, Tolkien had some pretty interesting thoughts on what to find a real dragon. According to Tolkien, there were only two, our old friends Fafnir and the Beowulf dragon. These guys were more than just big, scaly monsters. They meant something in their stories. Fafnir is an object lesson on the dangers of greed, while the Beowulf dragon kinda smacks the inevitability of age and mortality. To Tolkien, a dragon had to be essential to both the machinery and the ideas of the story. Essential to the machinery means important to the plot, while the rarer trait was being in line with the themes of the story. And you can kind of tell this in how he wrote his dragon. Smaug is definitely plot relevant, but his pride and deadly greed are also theme relevant, since those are the traits that end up leading to Thorin's downfall. This is a good angle, and it's very useful for the purposes of literary analysis, but I'm gonna respectfully disagree with the idea that these are the only dragons that matter. I think the fact that dragons can fill so many roles is much more interesting than the fact that only a few of them are actually structurally essential. Essential. Let's ask, why is the dragon the iconic fantasy creature? Why is it dungeons and dragons, not basements and basilisks, or mine shafts and manticores? Gorges and griffins? treasures and terrasks. Okay, sorry, I'll stop. Why are dragons so special? Well, there's a few reasons. Some of them we've already discussed. Since draconic folklore is present worldwide, dragons aren't restricted to any one specific region or culture, whereas critters like phoenixes, unicorns, or griffins are rather more localized and a little less universally recognized. We might wonder why exactly dragons are so widespread, and to that, I'd say we're asking the question backwards. It's because we categorize a lot of fundamentally different things as dragons. Apophis and Jormungandr are just really big snakes. Mesopotamian dragons have bird wings and lion bodies. Hydra Karim and Yamato no Orochi have way too many heads. Chinese dragons are highly intelligent gods, while Western European dragons are animalistic monsters. Some of them are venomous, some of them have toxic blood, and only a sparse handful of them can actually fly. So it's not, why are there so many dragons? It's, why are we classifying all of these things as dragons? And while this answer is a bit circular, it's because dragon has never meant anything more specific than that. Language is really defined by how we use it, and dragon has historically meant so many different things that it can't really have a rigid definition now. Dragons are everywhere because dragon can mean almost anything sufficiently snaky and powerful that can't readily be categorized as anything else. The most universally consistent traits of folkloric dragons are powerful and important. They're never irrelevant, they're never harmless or even weak. Even the nice ones can usually be very destructive when angered. Folkloric dragons are always powerful, and if they're not explicitly friendly, they are always a serious threat. This doesn't apply as universally to modern media, but you might have noticed it's always a purposeful subversion to make a dragon harmless. It surprises the audience because the danger is supposed to be baked in. So a cute tiny dragon or a dragon dragon that can't breathe fire is often played for comedy because it's an inherent contradiction to their original nature. Dragons are made to be powerful. It's the single consistent through line in their mythical portrayal. Compare a dragon to any other popular folkloric creature. A griffin is a lion plus a bird. A phoenix is a bird plus fire. A kraken is a giant tentacly sea monster that attacks ships. A manticore is a lion with a man's head and a scorpion's tail. A chimera is a lioness plus goat plus snake and also it breathes fire. A unicorn is horse plus spike. A mermaid is top half of woman plus bottom half of fish. A minotaur is head of bull plus body of man. A centaur is top half of man plus full body of horse, a satyr is top half a man plus goat legs and horns, they're all clearly morphologically defined. You can mess with the designs a bit, but fundamentally their formula is what makes them what they are. If you take away two of the centaur's legs, he's not a centaur anymore. If you put wings on the unicorn, it's 
an alicorn, I think. It's definitely not a unicorn anymore, but a dragon? Add as many horns as you want, put on more legs or take them away, even the wings are negotiable. It's still a dragon. Where these other things are defined by their specificity, a dragon is defined by its lack of definition. We can subcategorize and classify all we want, but a sea serpent is still a dragon, and so is a lindworm, and so is a wyvern, and so is an eight-headed snake that really likes booze. If it can't be classified as anything else, it can probably be a dragon. A dragon isn't a specific kind of creature, it's a category, like fairy or demon, with a few central characteristics and popular trends, but no strict morphological definition. This is why I never see the point of people arguing about dragon taxonomy. It's way too late to be worrying about that now. We've already been calling all of these things dragons for thousands of years. Anyway, this built-in versatility, plus the inherent power behind the trope, is a big part of why dragons are so popular. And because of that, they're really weighty. A dragon in your story isn't just a dragon. It's got the full weight of thousands of years of power-based tropes behind it. An ultimate enemy, a divine protector, a monster to slay, a curse to dispel, a treasure to win, a village to save. There's always something in the implications that makes them automatically important. Dragons are the iconic fantasy creature because they represent the full spectrum of what you can do with fantasy. Magic, curses, good versus evil, treasure, battle, heroic rescues, riding a motherfucking dragon because hell yeah. Dragons aren't rigidly defined, which means they have near limitless potential, which makes them the perfect symbol of a genre built on exploring the unrealistic and the fantastical. Dragons are awesome because dragons have always been awesome. In the most literal sense, awe-inspiring. Like I said, their defining characteristic is power. If you make a dragon, you're echoing sources from all over the world and every period of history reiterating that. It's trope subversive just to make a dragon small and cute because it's so built in that they have to be huge and dangerous. And even if the dragon is dealing with a bunch of other similarly huge and dangerous things, its dragonness alone will elevate it and make it stand out from the crowd. I've seen some people suggest that dragons are automatically cool because they're the ultimate fusion of every primal threat hard-coded into humanity. Venomous snakes, big cats, predatory birds, also fire. I get this argument, and dragons are definitely equipped to be the ultimate apex predator, but I think that's actually selling them kind of short. Dragons are really cool because they don't have to be any of those things to be a dragon. While the modern image of a stereotypical dragon is a scaly, fire-breathing, winged quadruped with one head, two eyes, some horns, and assorted spikes, if you want to call your primordial multi-headed sea serpent or your feathered flying snake or your usually human-shaped bad guy a dragon, nobody's gonna stop you. And because of what it means to be a dragon, the audience will know to expect something powerful and important no matter what shape it is. And it's funny, even a character who's not physically a dragon in any way can still get that kind of reputation by being nicknamed after a dragon. I ran a Twitter poll asking about people's favorite dragons, and one of the most common answers was Uncle Iroh, the dragon of the West. And also, let's be real, the ultimate fusion of human primal fears would probably have a lot more spiders involved. So, yeah. And thanks again to World Anvil for sponsoring this video. As you may know, World Anvil is a browser-based world-building software with a ton of features designed to make it simple and easy to keep track of your world. It's got old favorites like interactive world maps, plot and story timelines, family trees for keeping track of that ancient draconic bloodline, and custom wikis you can fill with major players and events. It's also got a fully customizable calendar with tools for lunar cycles, holidays, and more. On top of that, they've just added a big new feature, a writer's update. It's added a space to write in with a Scrivener-like layout that still lets you access all your world building, so now you don't need to swap between World Anvil and your writing software to get your work done. It's currently an open beta, and the creators would love to hear your feedback, so it's a good time to weigh in on how you want it to work. If all that sounds good, the great part is the base features are all free. And if you want to get the frills too, you can get 20% off a master or grandmaster membership with the promo code OverlySarcastic.